If I told you that I am budgeting my money right now, that way I can live off of $7,000 a year, you're probably gonna think that I'm never gonna eat guacamole again, or I'm gonna live in a box, or I'm gonna move to a third world country. But here's the thing, about 50 years ago, if you were living off of $7,000 a year, you'd be living pretty decent. I mean, $7,000 a year 50 years ago is like $50,000 a year today. This is where people think about building wealth and retirement and financial freedom all wrong because people always talk about, okay, when I become financially free, my goal is to be able to live off of $50,000 a year. But your $50,000 a year that you're thinking of is today's money. $50,000 a year today is very different than $50,000 a year 50 years from now. Just like how $7,000 a year today is very different than what $7,000 a year was back 50 years ago. So when we're talking about building wealth and investing your money for retirement or this financial freedom or whatever you wanna call it, you gotta understand two things. One, you gotta understand how your money works, that way you're using the money right way. And the second, you gotta know how to invest this 15% and why you need to be investing this 15%. But before I get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below because the way the YouTube algorithm works, if you do not smash that thumbs up button, then YouTube is much less likely to show you and other people our financial news and education videos. When the majority of people think of money, they relate it to stuff. How much stuff can my money buy me? If I make $1,000, what is this $1,000 worth? If you ask the majority of people, you relate $1,000 to how many nights can I go out? How many vacations can I go on? How many nice clothes can I buy? How many times can I buy extra guac? So the majority of people, when you think about money, is what stuff can I buy? The reason we call ourselves the minority mindset is because we think differently than the majority of people. When I want you to think about money, I want you to think about money in terms of how many assets can you buy? An asset is something that makes you money. And so now when you have $1,000 or $10,000 or $100,000, I want you to ask yourself, okay, now that I have this cash, how many assets, investments can I buy, which are things that are gonna make you more money? When I was younger and I made money, the question that I had was, how can I use this money to improve my car? I started by tinting my windows, and I got new rims, then I got subwoofers put in, then I got all this other stuff put in, and it was always this kind of like balance of, okay, I made $1,000, what can I do to my car? Ooh, I made $2,000, how can I upgrade my car? So anytime I made money before, it was, how can I spend this money in a way that's gonna better my car or whatever I have? This completely changed when I started investing in real estate because after I bought my first real estate investment property, it was making me something like $250 a month in profit every single month. And once I got it up and running and going, it was $250 a month passively, which means I wasn't doing any work. Every month, $250 was being deposited into my account. Now, all of a sudden, the way I thought about money completely changed because now I'm thinking in terms of houses and real estate instead of cars. Because now in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if I can make $250 a month from one property, that means from two properties, I can make $500 a month. With 10 properties, I can make $2,500 a month. With 100 properties, I can make $25,000 a month every single month passively without me having to do any work. As you grow, you'll start to realize that there's easier ways to do this. Like you might not have to buy 100 single family homes. Maybe you can buy an apartment complex and some properties are gonna pay you more per unit than others. But in general, that mindset is true. Now I'm thinking about assets instead of liabilities. I'm thinking, okay, when I make money, what investments can I buy? What assets can I buy? How can I use my money to make myself wealthier? How can I use my money to build more assets? How can I use my money to create more value? instead of just using my money to spend on nice things. You wanna have your nice things, I understand that. But when you make money, I want you to think about it in terms of assets instead of liabilities first. Once you start changing the way you look at money, it is gonna be so much easier for you to start investing your money and put more money aside to investing because before, putting this money aside was a chore because now you are sacrificing a nicer car, you are sacrificing another vacation, you are sacrificing all these nice things, but now you're not making that sacrifice. Now you're working more towards your goals of buying more assets because that's the way you're looking at money. Now you look at money as a tool to buy you more assets, which allow you to have nicer things. But now when you change the way you look at it, it's easier for you to make more of these sacrifices to buy more assets. That way you can have more freedom, have more wealth, and then ultimately have more of the nice things, the nicer cars, the nicer vacations. Now let's get into the numbers because if you're subscribed to our channel, chances are you've heard me talk about our 75 15 10 plan, which says for every dollar that you earn, 15 cents is the minimum you should be investing, 10 cents is the minimum you should be saving, and 75 cents is the maximum you should be spending. Now, I'm gonna go over that 15% investing. Why 15% and what the numbers actually look like when it comes to building your wealth. Here's the thing, 
Investing is the real secret to building wealth for regular people. It is not building the next Amazon. It is not finding the next hot stock before it pops. It is not winning the lottery. It's not having a job that pays you a million dollars a year. Yes, these things can help, but they are the exception to the rule. They're not the rule. So if you really want to build wealth, the secret, secret is investing your money. And the issue here is so many people are not doing this, even though I think we should know this by now. It's hard because on one hand, we're never taught about money. Like we don't go to school learning about how money works, how budgeting works, how investing works, how to build wealth. And on the second side, we just don't really have kind of a, a good financial culture when it comes to spending because we live in this debt culture where it is completely normal to finance your wardrobe. And so this is kind of the culture that we live in. And the only kind of financial education that people get nowadays is you go to your job and then your job gives you this packet which says, here's your 401k information. That's why right now half of America is not investing any money not a single penny at all. And on top of that, the people that are investing, most of them are only investing their money in their 401k, even though your 401k was never intended to be your sole retirement or investment plan. So if we kind of diagram this out, if this pie represents America, that's a very lopsided pie. If this pie represents America, only half of these people, so these people are not investing any money. Only half of these people are investing any money at all. Now, out of these people that are investing any money, the majority of these people, so something like this, are investing their money only in their 401k. This is the only people that are investing their money in their 401k and out of their 401k. These are the only people that are creating their own wealth and retirement outside of what's kind of just given to you. Out of these people that are only investing their money in their 401k, which was never intended to be your sole retirement or wealth building or investment tool, out of these people, the average 401k contribution is just 7% of your income. So you have a huge chunk of Americans that are not investing any money. And then you have this big chunk of people that are investing their money, but they're only investing their money in their 401k. And the average contribution is just 7%, which means you have only a few percentage of Americans that are investing more than 7% of their income every single year towards their wealth, towards their retirement, towards their financial freedom. If you really want to become wealthy, you got to invest more than 7% of what you're making. Now, let me show you why investing a minimum of 15% of your income is so important. Let's assume that now when you're 21 years old, you go out and you get a job paying you just $30,000 a year. So you are making $30,000 a year. And let's assume that you're investing 15% of your income every single year before taxes. So that means you are investing right around $4,500. So I'm also going to assume that you're working a job where your salary is going to grow over time. And let's assume that your salary just grows by an average of 3% a year. Now I know over time, hopefully your salary will grow by more than this, but let's assume just 3% a year because sometimes you're gonna get a raise, sometimes you're gonna go to a new job, maybe you'll get another bump there, maybe you get a promotion, but every single year you get a 3% annual bump. And as you continue to make more money, you continue to invest just 15% of your income. If you do that between the age of 21 and 65, you are going to save. So at 65, you continue to do this. You are going to put aside $400,000 over these 44 years. Now, if you just save this cash and you started living off of, let's say $30,000 a year, then this $400,000 would last you about 13 years. After 13 years, this $400,000 would go away. But you also got to remember that this is $400,000 about 44 years from now. This $30,000 a year in 44 years is not going to have the same value as $30,000 today. I mean, by the time you're 65, if you continue to grow your income by 3% a year, you're going to be making more than $100,000 a year. So if you want to continue maintaining your lifestyle at 65, that means you got to pull out $100,000 a year here. So your money's only going to last you four years. By the time you're 70, you're going to be broke. So this saving model doesn't work, which is why I want you to invest this 15% a year. If you invested this 15% a year and this $400,000 went into your investments and you got a below average return for the course of your life and you only got a 4% annual return on your money. If you were able to get a 4% average return on your money over your lifetime, then this $400,000 will grow to right around $900,000. 
quite a bit more, but you gotta remember, this is still quite a bit below average. If you got an average return of 7% a year, then this $400,000 you invested over your time would grow to $1.9 million on the side for you to now use however you want. And if you could grow your money by 10% a year, which is just a little bit above average, especially when you account for inflation, then your money would not grow to $1.9 million, it will grow to $4.8 million. But the only way this is gonna happen is if you're investing 15% of your income every single year. Now look, this is where you gotta really understand money because so many people make this mistake that when they're planning for wealth or retirement or financial freedom, they're thinking in today's dollars. They're thinking, okay, I'm young today. I'm hoping that I can live off of $30,000 a year or $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year because they're relating that to today's money. But $30,000 a year today is not gonna be the same as $30,000 a year 45 years from now. That's why your income is hopefully going to be adjusted with inflation and go up by a couple percent or a few percent a year. If you are 21 today and you're making $30,000 a year, by the time you're 65, if your income grows by 3% a year, you're gonna be making something like $106,000 a year by the time you're 65. So if we assume that $106,000 is what it takes for you to keep the same lifestyle as 65 as you do in 21, that means you gotta be pulling out $100,000 a year when it comes time for you to retire in order to keep the same lifestyle that you have today. Now, depending on how much money you're making, that might seem like a whole lot of money or not enough money, but what you gotta understand is that in 45 years, $100,000 a year is not gonna be as much as $100,000 a year today. So you gotta kinda plan for that with your money. And so if we're looking at this kind of income and you're thinking, all right, if I wanna maintain my lifestyle, I gotta be pulling out $100,000 a year. If you have $400,000 sitting there, that's not gonna cut it you're not gonna have a very nice retirement or financial freedom because after a few years, you're broke. Now here, if you get the 4% a year, now at least you have some more money and what you gotta also understand is because this money is invested, you're hopefully gonna continue growing it after you start pulling money out too because you're not gonna pull out all $900,000 at once, at least hopefully not. You're gonna pull out $100,000, let the other money grow, pull out another $100,000, let the other money grow and kinda go on like that. That way this can last you more than nine years. And here, assuming you can just get an average return, now you really have money put aside for the rest of your life because now you got money for at least the next 20 years. Because even if you're pulling out $100,000 at a time, that means you have your money growing for another 18 years after you pull this money out. So you pull out $100,000, your money continues to grow the next year because you only pulled out 100,000, you still got 1.8 million in there. And the next year you pull out another 100,000, you have 1.7 million growing for you. So as long as you got money in the account, your money will continue to hopefully grow. I want you to be an aggressive investor. Actually, I need you to be an aggressive investor because social security is becoming a thing of the past and pensions are becoming history. And so if you want to be able to take care of yourself and take care of your wealth and take care of your family and your finances, you got to be the one to put it in place and you got to be the one to start taking action because you cannot rely on the government to take care of you because the government national debt is skyrocketing. They have their own problems. It is very hard and very painful to rely on somebody else, especially the government to take care of you, which is why I want you to be an aggressive investor. That way you can take care of yourself and take care of your wealth. That way you can live your life the way you want, not worrying about what the government's gonna give you. Now, there are different ways that you can invest your money. That way you don't have to actually sell your assets in order to have money in your hand, like if you invest in rental properties, investment real estate, now you're creating passive income cash flow, that way you can get cash in your hand every single month without you having to actually sell a property. And if you're investing in dividend paying stocks, now you're making money every quarter or every year from your stocks, and you don't have to actually sell your stocks to get paid, but I'll get to that in just a second. Now here's the thing, most people don't start investing their money as soon as they turn 21. What you need to understand is the older you are, the more aggressively that you need to invest. Just because you're older and haven't started yet doesn't mean that you can't start, it just means you gotta be a little bit more aggressive. There's in general two different ways that you can invest your money. You have one way of investing your money, which is through retirement accounts. This is through things like a 401k or an IRA. And then the second way that you can invest your money is through non-retirement retirement accounts. This is through creating your own stock brokerage account and investing your money in stocks or through investing your money in physical real estate, not through a retirement account. And so this is money you're not doing in a retirement account versus retirement accounts. They can give you some tax benefits.
benefits. The whole purpose of a retirement account is literally to help fund your retirement because when you invest your money in these accounts, you can kind of get a tax deferral right now and then your money can grow tax free until it comes time for you to retire unless you use a Roth, then you're paying taxes today and then you don't got to worry about taxes when it comes time for you to pull your money out. I'm not going to get into too many details on this, but the whole purpose of this is for you to invest your money that way it can grow tax free, but you cannot touch your money until it comes time for you to retire. If you want to learn more about that, I will link a video where I've already discussed this in the description below. The point that I'm trying to hammer home here is your retirement accounts are typically not enough because your 401k and IRA has limits and you got to make sure now that you're not investing your money based off of what the government limits you at. You got to be investing your money based off of the way you want to live your life in retirement. That's why I say a minimum of 15% of your money needs to go towards your investments. Some of that money can go towards your retirement accounts, but if that's not hitting the 15%, then you got to be investing your money on your own too. That means maybe you got to create your own stock brokerage account, or maybe you got to start investing in your own physical real estate. That way you can get passive income. But here you got to know what your goal is first. If you want to see your money grow quickly and you don't mind taking on more risk, then you should consider investing your money in the stock market, especially in growth companies and these kind of more startup companies where these companies are trying to grow as quick as possible, as fast as possible. There's more risk involved because startup companies can fail and they might not work out, but you have the opportunity to see your money grow a whole lot quicker because these are companies that are working really hard to grow as big as possible and as fast as possible. If you just want to see slow and steady growth in your money, then you can look at investing your money in more blue chip companies. These blue chip companies are your bigger established companies that have already been there for a long time. They already have their systems and you're just investing your money in this company. That way you can see your money grow slowly. The advantage with this is you have less risk because these these companies are already established, you already know how they're making money, and you can kind of reasonably predict how much money they're going to make and how fast they're going to grow, so you have less risk and so you get lower potential returns. One thing that I do want to mention about investing your money in the stock market is that the stock picking game is not for most people because picking stocks requires a lot of work, a lot of research, and a lot of upkeep. If you're not willing to do that, then instead of investing your money in individual companies like trying to find the next Amazon or Google or Facebook, then what you can do is invest in something called a fund, like an index fund or an ETF, because these funds give you exposure to a whole bunch of different companies. And so you have less risk, you can put in less work, but now you're kind of growing with the stock market. I already made a video where I talked about that. So if you want to learn more about how to do that, I will link it for you in the description below. If you're looking for income, where now you can create cash flow or passive income coming into your account every month or every year, where now you can have money in your hands without selling your assets, then you want to be investing your money in things like dividend paying stocks, because because dividend paying stocks typically pay you a check every three months or you can invest your money in real estate because now if you own a house or you own an apartment complex, now every single month, the people that are living in your real estate or using your real estate have to pay you rent every single month because they're using your asset. So now when you own these assets like a dividend paying stock or rental properties, now you're making money consistently without you having to physically sell your asset. Real estate is also a really good store for your money because if you have a lot of cash and you want to put it somewhere safe, then real estate is a good place to do it because now you own something physical and tangible that you can see, feel, and touch, and that's creating income. Now, I know real estate prices don't always go up. You could see a real estate crash, but in general, if you own a property in a good area, then you own something that people need, that something want, and that you can see, feel, and touch. The key for any of this to work though, is you gotta be consistent and you gotta keep investing your money because investing is not a one-time thing. It's not like you can just take $10,000 and throw it in the market or go out and buy one investment property and say, all right, I'm done investing now. It doesn't work like that. You got to keep investing your money consistently if you want to continue to build your wealth. Yes, if you see a market crash, then come and buy as much as you can then because that gives you the opportunity to buy assets for pennies on the dollar. But in general, you got to keep consistently investing if you want to build this wealth because you got to keep putting more and more money towards your investments. Now, for a lot of people, they don't want to be in the game of trying to find the best companies and do the research and find the best time to come in and buy, which is why I say do it every time you get paid. Just create a system. Anytime you get a paycheck, 15% of that should be automatically invested. That way it kind of happens without you having to think about it. And that way you don't accidentally spend this money. There are apps out there that can automate this whole process for you. That way anytime you get paid, a portion of your paycheck will automatically be invested into whatever funds or stocks that you want it to go to. That way your money is constantly just going out without you even seeing it. And that way you're not even tempted to touch your money. If you want to learn more about how to actually do that, our team wrote an amazing article on our website, theminoritymindset.com. 
and I'll link it for you in the description below. Building wealth is really a game where you gotta juggle time and how much money you have to invest because the more time that you have on your side, the more your wealth can compound and the bigger your wealth can grow and the more money you have to invest, the faster that you can grow your wealth. But the tricky thing about this, if we look at it practically, is most of us make more money when we're 50 or 60 than we do when we're 21. And so you kind of get more of your money towards the end of your career, but you have more time in the early part of your career, which is why you gotta balance it out. You gotta start investing aggressively early, that way you can put more money and have the time on your side, that way you can kind of grow your money and have more money working for you. And as you start to make more money, you continue to keep investing 15% of your income come month after month after month. That way you can continue to compound that wealth and continue to keep growing your money. Again, don't take what I'm saying as the ceiling. I want this to be the floor because right now the average person is investing nothing or very little. I want you to kind of up the minimum and make it so you're investing a minimum of 15% of what you make. Once you get the hang of that, then up it up 20%, maybe 25%, depending on what you're making. The more you can invest, the faster you can build that wealth. And the faster you can build this wealth, the more assets and income that you'll have. That way you can live the life you want without worrying about the price because you got your assets producing income, which can fund and buy you whatever it is you want. If you want to get your finances in order, the first thing you need to do is not hire an expensive money coach or financial planner or financial advisor. The first thing you need to do is just track your money. Once you're tracking money, you want to make some adjustments to how you're spending your money. Once you make those adjustments, make sure you're implementing those adjustments and then rinse and repeat. As you start to get your money in order, that's when you can start doing the fancy stuff. Maybe getting a financial advisor, maybe getting a money coach, maybe reading a whole bunch of financial books, maybe then start going out and figuring out how you want to invest your money. But the very first thing you got to do is you got to start tracking your money. And that means I want you just to go out and get a piece of paper, get a Google sheet, use an Excel sheet, does not matter. And at the very top, you got to write your income. Now, if you have multiple sources of income or if you have multiple incomes in your household, Write them down here. Where is your money coming in from? Is it your job, your W-2? Is it your side hustles? Is it your business? Is it your investment income? Wherever the income is, write it down right here. That way you know exactly how much money you made over the last month. You wanna do this month by month, that's probably the easiest way to do this. Then, once you got a total number for your income, the next thing you wanna do is you're gonna write down your expenses. Now, same concept. You're gonna take out your bank statements, you're gonna take out your debit card statements. You're gonna take out your credit card statements. I want you to take a look at all of your expenses. And the reason why it's easier if you use a Google Sheet or Excel Sheet is because it's gonna be easier for you to categorize these a little bit later on. But if you like paper, that's fine. Now, take out all of these and you need to know exactly where every penny went. How much money did you spend on restaurants? How much money you spend on groceries? How much money you spend on vacations? How much money you spend on your rent or your mortgage? How much money did you spend on your utilities? How much money did you spend on Netflix and everything in between? Write each one of these down. Then ideally you will categorize these and then you're gonna write down your total expenses. Then below that, you're gonna write your other numbers here. How much money did you save? How much money did you invest? And how much money did you give to charity? Once you have this right here, now you have a financial spreadsheet showing you what's going on with your money. Because most people, and I'm just saying this generally, I'm saying this statistically, most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, have absolutely no idea of how much money they're making, how much money they're spending, where they're spending their money, how much are they saving, and how much are they investing, and how much are they giving to charity. Start with this. Once you do this, I can immediately guarantee that as soon as you see this, you're gonna to wanna to make some adjustments. I don't even have to tell you what to do. And the reason why is because when you do this, you're grading yourself and you're gonna see, holy crap, how much money did I just spend at restaurants last month? How much money did I spend going out on my car last month? How much money did I spend on groceries last month? And immediately, you're gonna start making some changes. Because when you see how much money you spend at groceries, maybe you're gonna start creating a grocery list. And you're gonna say, unless it's on my grocery list, I don't buy this thing at the grocery store. If you see that you spent $600 at Benihana's last month, you're gonna say, okay, I'm not eating out this month. I'm gonna go and cook my own meals this month. So I don't wanna give you a blanket statement of how you start spending your money yet, because I want you to number one, track your money. Then number two, I want you to make adjustments on how you wanna start spending your money. And these adjustments that you make are gonna depend on what your financial statements look like. Then number three is I want you to actually implement these things. That means now you have the statement for last month. What do you think you're gonna do next month? 
yes, you're going to lose again. That means month after month, and it shouldn't take you that long after you do it the first time. The first time, it's going to take you the longest. The second time, it's going to take you a little bit less time. But by the third time, you're going to be able to do it in 15 to 30 minutes. Every month, you want to make a little sheet of how much money you're making and what's going on with your money. That way, you can understand what's going on with your money because it's going to help you make better decisions with your money. Then, it's number four, rinse and repeat. Because now what's going to happen is once you take a look at this two months down the line, you're going to have a much better financial grasp of your money. You're going to see how much money you're making. You're going to know what your expenses are like. You're going to have a better control of your expenses. And now you're going to be looking at how can I optimize my expenses? How many of these bills can I renegotiate? How many of these bills can I get rid of because I'm not using them before? Can we downsize the car? Do we really need a car this expensive that takes premium gas that has $782 a month just in the monthly payment without including all the other fees? Can you downgrade on these items? And these are the questions you're going to start answering when you get to month two and month three, and I don't have to tell you what to do. You have to start with this if you want to get your finances in order, because most people's financial statements look like this. You make money, you spend money, and then you wonder where all of your money went. And then everybody says, Oh, okay, well, I'm making some money. I got to get my money in order. I have no real wealth. I have no real investments. I want to get my life in order. I want to have some cash in the bank. Maybe you should start investing my money. And so now you have this financial statement going on right here. And then the next thing that people do is they go open a stock brokerage account. Now I'm going to start throwing some money to the stock brokerage. You put aside $1,000 and now you put $1,000 into the stock brokerage account. And you can say, I'm now going to become wealthy with this $1,000 investment. What stock should I buy? And now you go out and buy a stock that you read online that you think is a good investment. And then when the stock goes down in value to $780, you wonder what the heck is going on in the world. You thought that investing was supposed to make you richer, but now you just lost 200 some dollars by putting your money into what you thought was a good investment. This is how most people become and stay broke. It's not because you're not investing your money to the right places, it's because you have no system of what to do with your money. Once you got this in order, the next thing you want to do is create a few different bank accounts. I like to say that you need to have at least three different bank accounts. A bank account for your spending money, a bank account for your savings money, and a bank account for your investments money. And the reason why you want to keep these in separate bank accounts is because if you keep all of your money in one bank account, how do you know which money is supposed to be invested? which money is supposed to be saved for an emergency, and which money is supposed to be spent. And you might say, oh, I'm good with the money. I know that this $3,000 that's in there is just for my savings, and this $8,000 there is for my investments, and the other money I can spend. Well, when it's all in one bank account, it's very easy to accidentally spend your savings money, and it's very easy to accidentally finance your investment money. And this is why you want to go out and create three different bank accounts. And what you can do now, thanks to technology, is many banks will allow you for free to create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way now when you get paid in one bank account, you can automatically have some of this money move to your second bank account. So you have three different bank accounts. This is where all your money gets deposited when you get paid. Then anytime you get paid, you can create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way a percentage of this money goes into your investment money and a percentage of this investment goes into your savings account. Now you're separating your money that way you cannot accidentally spend your investing money and you can't accidentally spend your savings money. Now this is where everybody asks, well, how do I invest my money and where do I invest my money? I'm not going to go too deep into investing in this video, but we have a full ebook on how do you invest your money at Briefs Media titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor. And this starts from the basics of how do you build the mindset of an investor to how do you save your first couple thousand dollars, but then it gets a little bit more advanced going over different investing ideas. How do you invest for cash flow? What are different investing strategies? To how do you spend your money smartly? To then how do you earn more money? To then how do you protect your assets? There's a ton of value in this ebook. You can read this ebook completely for free. All you gotta do is click the link down in the description below or go to briefs.co slash ebook. The biggest shift here when it comes to getting a hold of your finances, turning your money around and becoming wealthy isn't just creating some financial system and building some financial education. It's also about the mindset of money. Because a lot of times we grew up with no financial education and no idea of how we're supposed to use and spend our money. And so most people assume now when you start making money is you gotta go out and spend your money. This is America's consumerism mentality. Hate it or love it, that is what it is. And it's great for people who understand this because now you own the businesses, you own the investments that profit when people spend their money. But when you don't understand this, you're the one that's spending all their money, going into debt to make the rest of the country rich at your expense. 
And that's why it is so important for you to understand this, because if you don't understand this, you're the reason why everybody else gets to drive around in the nice cars. You're the reason everybody else gets to fly around in the private jets and fly first class. You're the reason everybody has those nice homes. It's because you keep spending all of your money. It's because you keep going into debt to make other people rich before you make yourself rich. That means, number one, if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you can't go out and spend $1,000. And that means if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you cannot afford a $1,000 jacket. You cannot afford a $1,000 handbag. You cannot afford a $1,000 iPhone. Because there's a difference between being able to afford something and being able to buy something. See, most people assume that if I got $50 in the bank and I want to buy a $1,000 phone and it's a $40 a month payment, I can afford the phone because I can afford the $40 monthly payment. But being able to afford something and being able to make the monthly payments are two completely different things. And now, if you want to be able to actually afford it, that means you got to be able to buy the whole thing without having to finance it. The only exception to this that I would make is the home that you live in. But now, when it comes to buying things like a phone, buying things like a car, buying things like a sofa, buying things like a TV, stop financing it. Buy it with cash. Yes, including that car too. The reason why so many Americans are broke, if you had to just pick one item, it's because of how much money people are spending on their car. More and more Americans now have a $1,000 monthly car payment. I think it was 20% of all Americans who have a car payment have at least a $1,000 a month car payment. That is a whole rent payment for a lot of the country. So now, when you're spending $1,000 a month just on the car payment, the next thing you gotta pay for is the expensive gas. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of insurance. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of oil changes. And then the next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of maintenance on top of all of that. So it's not just a $1,000 a month car payment you gotta pay. Now you're paying $3,000 a month just to keep up with this car. So now if you wanna break out of that, go out and buy a used car with cash. If you were gonna put $8,000 down to go out and finance this nice car, take the eight grand, go out and buy a car with cash. Yeah, it's not as nice, but you don't gotta worry about the payments. Now you take those payments and you reinvest it back into yourself. But then you're gonna say, but just breathe, if I have $1,000 in my bank account, why can't I buy a $1,000 jacket? Or a $1,000 iPhone? Or a $1,000 handbag? I mean, if I have $1,000, I can actually afford it, right? Well, kind of. Yeah, you can buy it. But if you really want to be able to afford it, you can't spend all of your money to buy this thing. That's why one of the things I like to follow is a simple rule of five, which says if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. Now, you start to really change the way you think about spending your money. If you got $1,000 in your bank account, that means the most you can buy is a $200 phone, or a $200 jacket, or a $200 handbag. And that way now you're not spending all of your money. It changes the way you think. Now at first you're gonna say, well how the heck am I supposed to afford a lifestyle if I start to live so much smaller? Well, you'll find a way. Because if the government were to tax you tomorrow, impose a brand new 30% tax on your income, what are you gonna do? You're gonna kick, complain, scream, cry, and then you're gonna find a way to pay it. And that's exactly what you gotta do right now, is you gotta find a way in the beginning to live smaller. Now, I'm gonna say this again, the goal is not to live small for the rest of your life. The goal is not to sit there and pinch pennies for the rest of your life. Pinching pennies is never gonna make you wealthy. Because at the end of the day, a penny saved it's just a penny. But you gotta start by understanding how to control your spending before you start worrying about how you can earn more money because if you start earning more money without knowing how to control the spending, well now you end up in a bigger financial hole. And this is what we see happen for so much of America, is people work to get a raise, they work to get a promotion, they work to get a bonus, you make some more money, now you start driving a faster car. You live in a bigger home. You go on a more expensive vacation because you make more money. And this is where you gotta understand why you're working to make more money. Because what wealthy people are doing in this economic system is you're working to make more money to buy more investments. And if you can buy more investments, these investments will continue to make you money because of the way our economic system works. And now if these investments are making you more money, well now you can take the money your investments make and start to use that to live a bigger lifestyle. And this takes time to do. The reason why so many people don't wanna do this is because, well, it's gonna take me a long time to start making any money from my investments. And you're 100% right. That's why I call it a decade of sacrifice. But if you can put in that decade of living smaller and working to earn more money, that way you can invest more aggressively, after a decade, you're gonna have a whole new stream of income, maybe a whole new asset that's producing more money for you that you can start using to live a better life. But most people are not willing to put in that time. Most people are not willing to put in that work. Most people are not willing to put in the effort or make those sacrifices. And that's why most people will never become wealthy. And that's why most people will continue to complain and hate the system.
Now, the problem with that is that's never going to actually help you with your financial situation. Complaining and hating and bringing everybody else down and bringing down the rest of the world, it's not going to help you feed your family. It's not going to help you take your kids to Disney World. It's not going to help you buy your spouse the handbag that he or she wants. If you want to be able to have the nice things financially, you got to go out and get more money. And that means you got to understand how to use your money smartly. That's the first step. And that means number one, you got to understand how to track your money. Once you can start tracking your money, you make the adjustments, you start implementing and you keep working on this, then you got to figure out how can you control the spending. Once you can figure out how to control the expenses, because now you got the income coming in, you got to control these expenses so you have more money to invest, then is how can you earn more money? And this is where things start to get fun. Because now the question is, how do you go from $40,000 a year to $400,000 a year? And at first, you might hear that and say, how in the world can somebody like me go from 40 to 400? That doesn't make any sense. But when you start asking that question, you're going to start looking for new answers. Now you're going to start watching different YouTube videos. You're going to start watching YouTube videos on how do you earn more money? How do you start a business? How do you start a side hustle? How can you increase your income? How can you change your career? How can you get a new certificate? And then you can start doing different things. And as you start doing different things, now you're going to start seeing your income change as well. It's not going to happen overnight. This is a process. Remember, a decade of sacrifice is more than just six months. We're talking about a decade of work, effort, time, and learning to put in the work, to put in the effort. That way you can start getting the rewards of your effort after putting in the work, after putting in the time. Most people put in the work for six months and say, where's my reward? But you got to keep coming back, putting in the reps, and understand now, what are the questions you got to ask? Because once you can control this, then it's all about how can you grow this. And as you grow this, remember, the key is to grow how much money you're putting into investments. If you can grow how much money you're putting into investments, you're going to be able to grow how much wealth you will be able to build. And if you can own more assets, then you also get to buy more freedom. Stop spending your hard-earned money. The number one reason why wealthy people become and stay wealthy is because they do not spend their hard-earned money. Now you might hear that and say, but just Fareed, what are you talking about? Wealthy people have nice cars, they have nice homes, they have nice stuff. How do they have that if they're not spending their hard-earned money? They're spending money that they did not work hard to earn. They're spending money that their money worked hard to earn. And if you understand this concept, it will help you become wealthy. And this is the one thing that so many people around the world are doing wrong, which is what's keeping so many people broke, because what most people do is they make money and then they spend it. And then they make more money and then they spend more money because we assume that we make money to spend it, but wealthy people are doing something completely different. Think of it this way. Imagine you want a million dollars tomorrow. What would you do with that million dollars? Now, what most people would do is take the million dollars and go out and buy a new car, buy a nice home and buy some nice stuff. Or maybe if you're a little bit more financially educated, you might say, you know what? I don't want to blow all that money on a car and a plane or what all the stuff that I want, even though you can't really buy a very nice plane for a million dollars. I'm going to take this million dollars and I'm going to divide it up. My expenses are $50,000 a year. This million dollars is going to last me for 20 years and we're going to ignore inflation. So now, you take 50 grand out this year, 50 grand out the next year, 50 grand out the year after that. You don't have to work anymore. You're financially free, but you're only financially free for 20 years. I want you to think in terms of interest or dividends or royalties from now on, because that's how wealthy people think. Wealthy people think if I get a million dollars, I could take a million dollars and go out and buy an investment property, a piece of real estate that's going to pay me Fifty to seventy thousand dollars in profit a year, assuming I don't buy it with any debt. Let's just assume that right now. I buy this million dollar investment property, and now I'm getting fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year forever. And I also still own the investment property. And then if I buy it in a good area, not only are my rents growing, but also the investment property value is growing. Now I am truly wealthy because I have this cash flow coming in from my investment property that will continue to pay for my expenses even when I'm not working. Now you're gonna say, but just breathe. I don't got a million dollars. I understand, most people don't, but guess what? You don't need a million dollars to start doing this because if you want to become wealthy, you gotta start living, you gotta start living off of the interest that your money can generate. You gotta start living off of the dividends that your money can generate, or you gotta start living off of the profits that your money can generate. If you can live off of the profits, the interest, or the dividends that your money generates, 
Now you will become financially free. And it is not going to happen tomorrow. This is a lifestyle change. If you want to become financially free, you have to put in the reps. Just like becoming healthy is not something you do for two months or six months or two years. It's a lifestyle change. Becoming financially healthy is a lifestyle change where now you got to spend less than what you make. Take the money that you're not spending and work to put this money to work, whether it's in stocks, whether it's in real estate, whether it's in your business. You got to put this money to work that way. Now your money can produce you more money because if you can live off of the money that your money makes now you are financially free and you own an asset, whether it's stocks, whether it's a business, whether it's real estate. You own this asset that's going to keep spitting off money, that's putting money in your bank account. And if you do it the right way, your asset, your stocks, your real estate, your business is also becoming more valuable. And this is the true key to becoming wealthy. It's not just by making a bigger salary. Most people assume that if I just made more money, if I made an extra thousand dollars a month, oh man, my life is going to be so much easier. But statistically, what we have seen in America is that when the majority of people, more than 50% of Americans make more money, they end up in a bigger financial hole. Because when you make more money, not only can you buy more things, but you can qualify for more debt. And when you can qualify for more debt, the majority of people go out and spend more money. Again, when I say majority, I mean more than 50% of Americans. We have seen this happen statistically time and time again. Today, at the time of me recording this video, more than 50% of Americans who are making over six figures a year are living paycheck to paycheck. Why? Because when you make more money, banks look at you and say, oh, you got a little raise, huh? Congratulations, we're happy for you. How about a new car? How about a nice vacation? How about we finance a bigger home for you? And it's very easy to get caught up in this spending trap. But I want you to also understand this. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with buying big things. There's nothing wrong with buying luxury things. I want you to have all that. But the key is when you're spending money to buy something that's not making you money, a liability. I don't care if it's a car. I don't care if it's your clothes. You want to have nice things? Great. If you really want to be able to afford it and never have to worry about money again, you want to be buying these things with their assets, with the money that your money makes. Now, is this easy? Absolutely not. It is going to take for most people at least a decade before you start to see any significant income. However, if you stick with it, that decade is going to go by and then you will start having a significant income because if you're 32 years old right now, well, eventually you're going to be 42. Eventually you're going to be 52. Eventually you're going to be 62. And the question is, as you get older, what do you want to see happen with your money then? Do you want to be in a position where now you're much more financially free or do you want to be in the same position that you are right now? And if you want to be in a position where you're more financially free, you have to start putting in action steps today to start putting your money to work. And that means actually, number one, building a system with your money. I broke this down in my live investor summit. If you have not seen my investor summit, I'll link it for you down in the description. It's a free video you can watch. The first thing you gotta do is you gotta build a financial system that will allow you to always invest your money first. You can come up with whatever numbers you want. I say at the very least, start with something like a 75, 15, 10 plan, which says for every dollar that you earn from here on out, 75 cents is the maximum that you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum that you're investing. 10 cents is the minimum that you're saving. Create three different bank accounts. That way now you have your spending money in one bank account, your investing money in another bank account, and you're saving money in a third bank account. Now you have some money that needs to be invested. And ideally you can invest more aggressively, but of course everybody has a life going on that you need to spend money on. I understand that, but hopefully as you can continue to build, you can spend more money on your investments because that's where your wealth is built. If you want to stop relying on the government, you want to stop relying on your job, you want to stop relying on everybody else, you got to build your own wealth and that means you got to own and create your own assets. And I understand no one's taught us this before. No one told you this before. No one emphasizes this and it can be hard as you're starting your financial education journey but this is the real way out of the financial mess it's not getting a bigger paycheck it's not bigger checks from the government it's you taking charge of your finances it's you saying screw this i'm done being in debt to all these companies i'm done being in debt to the bank i'm done spending all my money on everybody else and I'm gonna spend my money to make myself rich first because what most people are doing is they are working hard to make somebody else rich and I don't mean that in the sense that you're working hard in your company to make a boss rich I mean you are working hard 
to make everybody that you're spending money at rich. See, most people complain, oh, I go to work so hard just to make my boss richer each and every day. But what they don't realize is you're working hard every single day, not just to make your boss richer, but to make every company spend your money at richer, to make the Gucci company richer and those salespeople richer, to make your car company richer, to make your Lululemon richer. That's who you are making richer when you go out and you spend all of your money. Now again, nothing wrong with spending money, nothing wrong with buying nice things, nothing wrong with having nice things, nothing wrong with wanting nice things. But I want you to be able to afford it first. And that means right now you can't keep spending all your money at this stuff because the stuff isn't making you money. If it's not making you money, cut back on that. And now you're going to say, but just believe, can I just earn more money? Yes. But before you go out and earn more money, you got to know how to control your spending. Because now when you earn more money, there has to be a reason why you're working to earn more money. Are you working to earn more money to have more nice things? Or are you working to earn more money that you can have more investments? I want you to earn more money that way you can have more nice investments because now these investments can pay for your nice stuff. And this is tough. Look, I'm going to tell you honestly for me, I'm saying this like a heart to heart. I want you to understand this. The first time I made a million dollars in a year, that's a lot of money. I'm talking about over $100,000 in a month. I took into my personal bank account right around $20,000 because I wanted to reinvest this money to building more profits, more dividends, more distributions. That way I have more cash flow coming in because this is something that I wanted to change. I didn't grow up with any financial education. I didn't grow up with people telling me, hey, put your money to work. I didn't grow up learning this stuff. But when I saw it, I realized, whoa, this is what wealthy people are doing. And if you want to break out of the system of what everybody else is doing, of being stuck in what people call the rat race and this payment scheme of always being in debt, of always just blowing your money to look like everybody else, of always just wanting the nice things because, oh, yeah, everybody else has got the cool stuff on Instagram. Listen, at the end of the day, the Instagram stuff is cool on social media. But at the end of the day, you got to be the one that's got to pay the bills. You're the ones that's got to pay for your colleges, your kids' college. You're the ones that's got to pay for your kids' vacation. You're the one that's got to pay for your wife to get the nice stuff that be you have the stuff that she wants, or your husband to have the stuff that he wants, or for your kids to have the stuff that they want, or for you to have the stuff that you want. But it takes money. But it also takes the financial education. And you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have the financial education, you're going to be broke. That's why they say that most wealthy families lose that wealth within three generations. Because that mindset that it took somebody to build that wealth is different than the mindset of somebody who just wants to spend the money. And this is where right now, if you want to become wealthy, you got to build that mindset and understand how you can spend your money differently and start living off of the interest, off of the distributions, after the profits, off of the dividends, off of the cash flow that your money can generate. Because if you can do that, now you are financially free. And now you've built a whole new system and you can break the cycle of whatever you're in in your family. And you can be the first one to build true wealth, buy your parents something nice, buy yourself something nice, buy your spouse something nice. But it requires time, dedication, and sacrifice. It is not easy. And on top of that, you're going to go through market ups and downs. You're going to see market crashes. You're going to see recessions. It's a part of our economic system. But as you build that financial education, you're also going to be able to find the opportunities the market crashes and the recessions and the economic downturns and the up economic upsides too. And this is where now it all starts with you building that mindset and going out and taking action because it is your duty now to go out and become successful. I think that's enough for my rant for today. If you're broke, most people will tell you that you need to number one, go out and earn more money. And then number two, go out and get a 0% APR credit card and move all of your debt there. But this is the worst thing that you can do right now. I'll show you. Right now, the majority of Americans are broke. The majority of Americans have little to no savings and the majority of Americans have little to no investments. This is where the first thing everybody says you should do is figure out how you can earn more money. Except that doesn't work. Statistically, when most people earn more money, they end up in a bigger financial hole. Why? Because when you earn more money, you have the ability to spend more money. When you earn more money, you have the ability to qualify for more credit cards. When you earn more money, you qualify for more debt, bigger lines of credit, which means now you can spend more money, buy more things with money you don't have, which digs you into a bigger financial hole, which is why we see so many six-figure earners in America broke, living paycheck to paycheck. And it's not because of how much money you're making, it's because of what you're doing with the money. Earning more money is important, but you got to know when to earn more money. And if you're one of the millions of Americans that has credit card debt, this is where everybody says, just move this credit card debt to a 0% APR credit card, that way you don't have to worry about the interest anymore. Except that doesn't work either. 
When most people hear 0% APR, they think zero cost. That's why industries selling you 0% APR are so profitable because they are giving the illusion of free money so you can buy whatever you want and worry about the price later. And that's why I like to call buy now, pay later, broke now, broke later. Now again, this doesn't mean that you should avoid 0% APR altogether. This means you need to know when and how to use it the right way. That's why in this video, I wanna go over the five things that you need to do in this order if you are broke to fix being broke right now. And as a little disclaimer, I'm just a random guy on YouTube. I'm not a financial advisor, so always do your own due diligence and don't blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. And if you stick with me until the end of this video, I'm also going to show you how you can get a copy of this ebook, How to Build Wealth as an Investor, that my team at Briefs Media wrote for free. So if you stick with me to the end, I'll show you how you can get a copy of this for free. The five things you need to do are number one, you got to stop the financial bleeding. Number two is you got to figure out how to pay down your high interest debts if you have any. Number three is you got to figure out how to get more money. Number four is you got to make a lifestyle adjustment. And number five is you got to let your money make you more money. So let's start by talking about number one, how do you stop the financial bleeding? The fastest way for you to have more money is by stopping your money from leaving your bank account. That means right now you gotta number one, stop eating out of restaurants. Number two, stop going out on vacations. Number three, stop going to the Gucci store. Number four, stop going to the mall in general. And number five, you gotta cancel that monthly massage membership. This one is painful, but you gotta stop letting money leave your bank account. Once you stop spending your money on these things, the second thing I want you to do is I want you to renegotiate some of your bills lower. Call up your cable company, your internet company, your phone company, and see if they can lower your bill because what ends up happening with these service and utility companies is every year they slowly keep raising your bill and they hope you never notice it and they hope you never call. But if you take 15 minutes, you can save 15% on your bill. I know it sounds like the Geico commercial, but this is where what I want you to do is take a look at what your competitors are charging for these utility and service companies and then call up your company and see if they can bring your bill a little bit lower. It's an easy way for you to save some money without sacrificing anything. And then the third thing that I want you to do is I want you to make a spreadsheet. I don't care if it's on a piece of paper, Google Sheet, Excel, take a piece of paper and you need to write down where your money is coming and where your money is going. This one is difficult, not just because it takes some time, but because it takes some real mental health, some real mental capacity to really look at what you've been doing with your money. So what I want you to do, take a piece of paper like this or a Google Sheet, and at the very top, you need to write down where your income is coming from. Is it your job? Is it your business? Is it your investments? Write down all of your sources of your income for the last month at the top. Then I want you to write down all of your expenses. Now, this is going to be through your credit card statements, through your debit card statements, through your bank statements. I need you to write down every single place where you spent your money over the last month. Then at the bottom of this, I want you to write where else you put your money. How much money did you save? How much money did you invest? How much money did you give to charity? You want to write this all down because you need to know where your money is going. In business, they say if you cannot track it, you can't optimize it. Well, it's the exact same thing here with your money. If you don't know where your money is going, how in the world are you gonna be able to optimize your money? This is gonna take you a little while the first time you do it. It might take you an hour the first time you do this, but you wanna do this once a month. At the end of the month or the beginning of the next month, take a look at where all of your money went. And the reason why you wanna do this is because as soon as you do this, you're going to see a whole bunch of expenses you forgot that you had. You're gonna find subscriptions you forgot that you were paying for. You're gonna see how much money you're spending on groceries and the organic food that you didn't need from Whole Foods. You're gonna see other places where you can start renegotiating your bills a little bit lower. And then automatically, you're gonna look at them and say, wow, I gotta stop spending so much money at Benihana's. And when you do that, that's going to allow you to finally start living within your means, meaning you're no longer going out of your means. You're no longer going into the payday loans or your credit card to just make your monthly payments. Because if you keep relying on other people's money to make your bills, you will never, ever, ever have the opportunity to get ahead. So start with this. Once you finish this, this is where now you come to number two, which is your high interest debt pay down. To really understand this, let me show you the power of compounding your money and investing your money. Let's assume now that you can invest $100 a month and you start this at the age of 25. And if you're not 25 years old, well, let's assume that you're 25 years old and you start investing $100 a month and you put this money into the stock market and you can get an average 20% return a year and you do this until you retire when you're 65 years old for 40 years. Now when you retire, guess what? You're gonna have $10 million to your name in your investment account from the small little $100 a month investment. Now you're gonna hear this and say, but Jasprit, I can't go back in time to 25 years old. Or Jasprit, 
I don't know where I'm going to get a 20% return on my money. How do you do that? Well, do you want to know a company that's getting a guaranteed 20% return on their investments being paid by you? Your Visa, your MasterCard, your American Express. Your credit card company is charging you 15, 20, 25, sometimes 27, 28% in interest on every dollar that you spend that you don't pay back in time and you were the one that's making your credit card company rich. This is the interest that you're paying to your credit card company. Everybody talks about, oh, when do I put my money in the stock market? How do I grow my money in real estate? How do I put my money into this? But the first thing you gotta do is you gotta pay down this high interest debt first. And that means now you started with cutting up some of these expenses. Well, now you gotta really figure out how you can attack this high interest debt. This is where now it could be worthwhile for you to move some of this high interest debt to something like a 0% APR credit card. Notice before we do that, you gotta figure out how to stop the financial bleeding. You gotta figure out how to control your spending before you move your money to a 0% APR credit card because what ends up happening to so many people is you take this debt that you have and you move it to a 0% APR credit card and you think of it like free money. You forget about the interest that you're supposed to be paying and then you start swiping like you did before. Now your debt balance starts to increase instead of decrease, and then the 0% APR period expires, and now you get hit with even higher interest rates. Now you're stuck in a bigger financial hole that you were in before, which is why before you move your money into a 0% APR credit card, the first thing you gotta do is figure out how to control the spending. Then, this is where this can be worthwhile, because now if you don't have any interest for 12 or six or 18 months, now you can attack this debt as fast as possible, put more money towards this debt, that way you can pay this off quickly, because if you are the person that is making your credit card company millions of dollars over the course of your lifetime, you are the reason other people get to fly in private jets and you don't get to have the benefit because you're the one that's paying for all those expenses. And this is where I want you to understand this and work now to pay down the high interest debt. Once you do that, once you start attacking the high interest debt, once you pay down the high interest debt, this is where now we talk about number three, which is how do you get more money? You can do this in conjunction with number two because what you're gonna realize is if you wanna pay down this high interest debt faster, well, if you have more money, you can pay down that debt even faster. Now, the reason why I talk about getting more money after controlling your spending is because, well, like I talked about in the beginning of this video, when most people earn more money, they end up in a bigger financial hole. When most people make more money, they say, oh, I can go in and drive a better car. I can go on a nicer vacation. I can go in and get a bigger home. When most people make more money, they spend more money. And that's the reason why most Americans are broke and will continue to stay broke. So if you don't wanna continue being broke, you gotta know when you gotta get more money. And you gotta know why you're getting more money. Now you're not getting more money to drive a faster car, to go on a better vacation, to have a bigger home. You're getting more money, that way you can pay down this high interest debt faster, and that way you can invest more money, save more money, and build more wealth. Now how do you get more money? Again, you can do this from your job. You can do this by getting a career change. You can do this by getting a second job. You can do this by creating a side hustle. There are so many ways for you to create more money especially not because of the internet. There's an infinite number of ways to earn more money if you're willing to put in the work, if you're willing to take on risk, if you're willing to invest in yourself, if you're willing to fail, and if you're willing to try things. If you can do that, you will be able to make some more money. Now again, when you make more money, you're gonna be tempted to wanna to go to the Gucci store, to go to Louis Vuitton, to go to Apple, to go to Lululemon, but this is where now I want you to take that money and use it to make yourself richer. The first thing is gotta pay down the high interest debt. Then when you get more money, you can put that money here, but we'll talk about that when it comes to number five. But you get more money, that way you can build more wealth because this is what wealthy people are doing. They make more money to buy more assets that make them more money. Wealthy people make money to make more money. They don't make money to drive a faster car. They let the money that the money makes buy them that faster car, but they're making money. They're working hard to make money to make more money. They're working hard to make money so their money can make them more money, and the money that the money makes is what's paying for their lifestyle. This brings us to number four now, which is a lifestyle adjustment. And this one is difficult. And if you don't like me now, you're definitely not gonna like me after this. And the reason why this is so difficult is because this lifestyle adjustment often happens where you realize, maybe I shouldn't have bought such a big home. Maybe I shouldn't have bought such an expensive car. Maybe I shouldn't have financed this car. Maybe I should have bought my car with cash. Maybe I should still rent a place. And this is a very tough realization because everybody in the world is selling you this idea that you gotta own a big and expensive nice home because this home that you live in is the best investment that you'll ever make. And that you work so hard, you deserve a nice car. You should finance your car. Everybody's financing their car, everybody's leasing a car. What's the big deal? You don't gotta worry about the maintenance as much when you lease the car. But 
If you're the person that's now paying five, six, seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars a month on their car, now 20% of America has a car payment that's over a thousand dollars a month. When you're paying all this money for your car payment, and then the premium gas, and then the insurance, and then the maintenance, well, you're oftentimes sacrificing your ability to actually build any wealth because all of your money is going to BMW, all your money is going to Mercedes, all your money is going to Jaguar and you have no money left over to take care of yourself. And so now when you realize this, that okay, I gotta pay down this high interest debt. I need to have some money for my savings. I need to have some money for my investments. But all my money is going to Gucci. All my money is going to Mercedes Benz. All my money is going to BMW. All my money is going to my landlord. All my money is going to my banker for my mortgage. This is where you gotta make a lifestyle adjustment. And that means now you might need to downsize your car. Get rid of that expensive car and go to a used Toyota Corolla or a Toyota Camry or a Honda Accord. Maybe that means you gotta downsize your house. Maybe that means you sell your house, pocket some cash, hopefully, and go into a smaller apartment, go into a smaller home. That way you have less payments. And this is so difficult, not only financially, because now you gotta sacrifice some of the nice things, but then everybody's gonna look at you like you lost your mind. Because when you downsize on some of these things, everyone's gonna think you're running into financial issues. Everyone's gonna think you're having family issues. Everyone's gonna be thinking that something went wrong in your head. When in actuality, you're actually building more wealth now than you were before, but the average person doesn't understand it and they can't see that. So now on the financial aspect, you have to understand, I wanna do this. And you gotta break the chains of that, what everybody else does and make the tough financial decision. And then after you do that, you gotta deal with all the mindset stuff. You gotta deal with all the criticism. You gotta deal with all the hate. But this is where you gotta make the decision. What's more important to you? Would you rather be a millionaire? Would you rather be wealthy? Would you rather have that financial freedom? Or do you want to look rich so everybody else thinks that you're just part of the club? And I'm going to let you decide what's better for you. Once you do that, this is where now you want to let your money make you more money. This is where the real wealth is built. Because what most people do is they make money to spend money. You make $1,000, you go to the mall and you spend $1,000. You make more money, you get a bigger apartment. You make more money, you go on a nicer vacation. This is how the average American is taught to think, and this is how the average American is taught to spend. And this is the reason why most Americans will never be rich, and this is the reason why some Americans will continue to get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier because they understand the system. And until you understand this, you're gonna be the person that's making everybody else rich at your expense. Now, what does this mean? This means taking your money, some of the money that you make, and instead of spending it, you're gonna use it to buy assets, things like stocks, things like real estate, things like businesses. These are the three most time-tested and proven assets that have built more wealth than anything else over the last century. So now, what do you do? Well, instead of going out and shopping at Louis Vuitton, at Gucci, at Chipotle, at Apple, you can buy a piece of these companies. How do you do that? Well, the stock market makes them more extensible. Instead of just going out and paying money to your banker or your mortgage or your landlord, you go out and buy a rental property. And this is where now you gotta change your mindset. Instead of just being a consumer, you wanna be the producer. And there are ways to do this that don't require a ton of time and a ton of effort, but you gotta start putting some of your money there. Now the nice thing is you don't need millions of dollars to start or hundreds of thousands or even thousands of dollars to start. But you have to start shifting your mindset because now when people go and shop at Lululemon, you're the one that's getting paid because you own a piece of the company. When you own some real estate or you own shares of real estate because there are companies on the internet that allow you to own shares of real estate, you can check out some of my affiliate partners down in the description. But when you own shares of real estate, well now you benefit when people pay rent. You benefit when real estate prices go up. Of course there's risk if the economy goes down, if you see a market crash, if you see a real estate crash, if you see a stock market crash, the value of your asset goes down. However, what we've seen over the last century is that despite the market crashes, despite the recessions, we've seen asset values rise. Now this requires some financial education to know how do you identify a good investment? How do you know when to hold on to an investment? How do you know when to buy more of an investment when things are down? But it starts with a shift of mindset of understanding, I need to go out and be an investor instead of just spending my money and making everybody else rich. Because when you're an investor, you're spending your money to make you more money. 
when you're a consumer, you're spending the money to make somebody else more money. It's that shift in mindset. And this is exactly what we cover in this ebook by Briefs Media. I told you in the beginning of this video that if you watch this video until the end, I'm gonna show you how you can get a copy of How to Build Wealth as an Investor for free. If you wanna get a copy of this ebook by Briefs Media, all you gotta do is click the link down in the description below or go to briefs.co slash ebook. And in this ebook, we start with the basics of how do you build the mindset of an investor, to how do you save your first couple thousand dollars, to how do you pay down your high interest debts, to then going a little bit more advanced, to how do you invest your money? What are the different ways that you can invest your money? How do you generate cash flow from your investments? To how do you spend your money smartly? To how do you earn more money smartly? To how do you protect your assets? There is a ton of value in this ebook. And if you want to read this ebook, it's completely free. I got the link for you down in the description. Most people think that you need big pockets, a lot of free time, or a Wall Street education to start investing. But that's a big lie, and I'm going to show you how in this video. If you want to be a successful investor, you have to start by asking yourself three questions. Number one, how involved do you want to be with your investments? Number two, what assets do you want to invest in? And number three, how do you want to get paid? When you ask yourself how involved do you want to be, this is more of a time question and an interest question because you could either be a passive investor or an active investor. A passive investor means that you're not going to have much time involved and you're not going to have to worry about really researching companies. It's passive on your end once you set up your investments. An active investor means that now you're not trading, but now you're looking for good investments and you're going to be spending time monitoring investments. So active Active investing is going to take more time. Passive investing is much more passive. What assets you invest in means now what do you want to actually put your money in? Is it the stock market? Is it the real estate market? Is it going to be businesses, startup businesses, or other companies that you invest in? Is it going to be cryptocurrency? Is it going to be a metal? Are you going to be lending your money? What do you want to actually invest your money into? And third, how do you want to get paid? Do you want to get paid with cash flow, meaning now you're getting paid without selling your asset? Or do you want to invest in something and then hopefully sell it for a profit in a year or five years or 10 years? What is your strategy to get paid? And now let's start by really diving into this and then we'll go into this and then we'll go into this. So let's start by talking about passive versus active investing. As a passive investor, what you're going to do is you're going to figure out what you want to invest in, that work is going to be front loaded. And once you figure that out, the work after that is completely passive. You're going to set up an automation that we know every time you get paid, whether it's every week, every two weeks, or every month, you pick the duration, it doesn't matter. But now every time you get paid, some of your money is automatically going to be invested. And now you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to monitor it every day. You don't have to sit there and watch the markets every day. You're going to set it up, automate it, and not worry about it. And now this is a long-term investment that will be working to build you wealth. And this is happening on the side without you having to do anything. An active investment, this is going to require more time on your end. Now you're going to be looking for individual investments, whether it's stocks or real estate or businesses that you're managing. Now you're looking for individual investments. And on top of that, you're also going to be spending the time to research the investment. So you have to be actually interested in investing your money and managing investments and researching investments. If you don't have any interest in that, and if you don't have the time to invest your money and manage these investments, then you want to focus on the passive side. If you love the idea of understanding finances, looking at companies, looking at real estate and looking at investments, then this is something that will be more interesting to you. With active investing, you have a little bit more risk, but you also have a little bit more upside. With passive investing, you have less risk, less upside, but also less downside. Now, you don't have to pick one or the other. Like, I am an active investor and a passive investor. Some of my investments are here, and some of my investments are here. So you can do both, but you have to understand what these two are, that way you know how to get started. And this brings us to number two, what assets do you invest in? And as a little bit of a disclaimer, I do have to let you know that investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money, which is why you need to always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. If you want to be a passive investor, the most accessible investments for you are going to be stock market investments or real estate funds. Not owning and operating physical real estate, but investing in funds that give you exposure to a real estate investment. If you want to be more of an active investor, some of them are stock. You can invest in real estate, you can invest in businesses, or a whole bunch of other different things. Let me start by talking about these types of passive investments, then we'll jump into the active side. If you want to make money in the stock market, most people think that you have to find the next Amazon, or they have to find the next Microsoft, or the next Google before it becomes popular. But for 90% of people, if you really want to make a lot of money and become a millionaire in the stock market, you don't have to go out and actually individually invest in companies or find the next Amazon. Instead, what you can do is invest in a fund that gives you exposure to a lot of companies. Now, there's a lot of different types of funds. You have ETFs, mutual funds, and index funds. 
But what you should be looking for, if you just want to be a passive investor, is a fund that gives you exposure to something that you believe in for the long term that doesn't charge you a lot in fees. So some funds are going to be what are called actively managed, meaning there's going to be a person actively trying to trade the best companies, trying to give you the best returns. But the downfall with that is you're going to pay higher fees versus a passively managed fund, which is going to be managed by a computer that's going to give you exposure to some certain index or group of stocks. And the benefit of this type of passively managed fund is that your fees are generally less. Now, what we've seen throughout history is that generally, not always, but generally, the higher fees are not going to justify the higher potential returns. Most of the time, especially when you look at it for the long term, the higher fees are going to eat up your more profits. So you end up losing money paying the higher fees than if you went with a lower cost fund. Does it always work like that? No, but generally that is the case. So for most people, generally you're going to be better off with a lower cost fund where now you're getting exposure to something that you believe in. And there are funds that give you exposure to pretty much anything. Like there are funds that give you exposure to the total stock market. There are funds that give you exposure to the S&P 500, which is a group of the largest 500 companies in the stock market. There are funds that give you exposure to the Dow Jones. There are funds that give you exposure to the NASDAQ. There are funds that give you exposure to financial companies. There are funds that give you exposure to tech companies. There are funds that give you exposure to international companies. And there are funds that give you exposure to emerging markets. These are countries and companies overseas that are starting to grow, that are seeing more growth over there, and they're not relying on the dollar as their currency. So now, once you start to think, what is it that you believe in for the next 10, 20, 30 years? How can you get exposure to that? And what fund will allow you to do that with the lowest fees? A few examples of some ETFs that will help start your research. And again, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just giving you these as examples are VTI. VTI is a total stock market ETF, meaning when you invest in this one ticker symbol, if you invest in VTI, you're essentially investing in the entire stock market because VTI invests in the total stock market. Then you have SPY and VOO, which invest in the S&P 500. These are S&P 500 ETFs. And as a little disclaimer, I have some of my own money invested in VOO. What that means is the S&P 500 is a group of the largest 500 companies on the stock market. Now, instead of you going out and investing in these 500 largest companies in the stock market, you can invest in either SPY or VOO, and these two ETFs will both give you exposure to these 500 companies. So when you invest in this or this, you are now essentially owning the 500 largest companies in the stock market. If you invest in DIA, which is the ticker symbol for an ETF, this gives you exposure to the Dow Jones. You might have heard of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow Jones is one of the most commonly talked about indexes, meaning groups that people look at to see what the health of the stock market is. And then QQQ is an ETF that gives the exposure to the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is a group of companies, about 100 companies that are the largest non-financial companies. Many companies in the NASDAQ are actually tech companies. So this is a way for you to start your research. And now this is a way now for you to invest in the stock market without having to find the individual company. And the way that you succeed as a passive investor here is you're going to create your own portfolio of ETFs that you want to invest in. You find what sectors you want to invest in. You find the ETFs that give you exposure exposure to these sectors and then you're going to create an automation. There are so many brokerages out there that can help you with this. I have my recommended brokerage, which is an affiliate of ours down in the description. Meaning if you use them, we will get compensated. You don't have to use them but you find a brokerage that allows you to do this, this type of passive investing. And then you're going to create an automation that way every week, every two weeks or every month, money is automatically going to be pulled out of your account and automatically invested. And then you're going to turn this on and leave it on no matter what's happening in the markets, because the biggest mistake you can make is when you go through an economic downturn or a recession or a market crash, you turn it off or you sell. That's not what you want to do with this passive strategy. You want to be investing for the long term. And when you go through a market crash or recession, the only thing you should be doing is potentially buying more because you are investing for the long term, the next number of decades. So what's happening in the next six months or the next two years are just a little bump in what should be happening over the long term. So you got to remember, if you want to succeed as a passive investor, especially in the stock market, you need to be investing for the long term. It needs to be automatic and it needs to be completely passive on your end. Now we can talk about investing in real estate. 
passively. The way real estate investing works is you can go out and buy a property, a home, an apartment complex, an office building, and now you buy it not to live in yourself, but to rent out to other people so other people can live in or use your property. And then this rent should cover your expenses and it leaves some money in your pocket every single month. Now, if you wanted to invest in real estate yourself like this, it's going to be much more active. That's why it's listed here. But on the passive side, the way it works is you take your money and instead of you going out and actually operating the real estate, you're going to invest in somebody else's real estate fund. So you can find a real estate investor. There's real estate investor conferences around the country, around the world. You can find an investor that's looking for money and now you can pay them. And when you pay them, now they will take your money. You will be a silent investor, a passive investor. They will use your money to go out and buy a property. And then hopefully they'll be able to rent it out and sell it or refinance it for profit, which is how you will make your money. Now, generally, you will make money if the property is generating positive cash flow, meaning profits from the rental income. And if they sell the property or refinance it at a profitable rate, that's how you get paid. There are apps on the internet that allow you to do this as well. Again, if you want to see one, you can check out our description for an affiliate that will help you to do that. But the whole idea here, just like with stock market investing, is now you're not going to be researching the individual projects. You're not going to be spending all that time to operate the properties. You're putting your money into a fund and you're letting somebody else, an investor, a developer, an expert, somebody in the real estate space is going to take your money and now they're going to be putting it into real estate for you that will hopefully you can make money. Are you guaranteed to make money? No, of course not. Investing has risks, just like investing in real estate has risks. All investments go through cycles, but as a passive investor, you have to understand you are a long-term investor, and when you don't actively manage it yourself, your risks are lower and your upside is also lower. Now, before we move on to active investing, if you do want additional resources on how to start investing, we put together a full guide on how to invest your money and start generating cash flow in my Market Insiders company. So if you want to read this guide on passive income, it's completely free, and I'll put the link to how you can read this guide on investing and generating passive income down in the description below. As an active investor in the stock market, now instead of investing into these funds, what you're going to be doing is looking for individual companies. So if you invest in a fund, you might get exposure to the Amazon company, the McDonald's company, the Coca-Cola company, and 400 other companies in a fund. But if you invest in the Amazon company itself, now you're actually researching the Amazon company. You're keeping up with the earnings calls. You're going to look into the finances of the Amazon company. And then you're going to look at the actual innovation of the company. Is, is something you want to invest in for the next 10 years? And then when you find a good price, that's when you would go in and buy. It's going to require much more work on your end because now you're going to have to actually keep up with the company as opposed to investing in a fund that gives the exposure to Amazon and 400 other companies because now when you invest in the Amazon company, you're taking on all the risk because if Amazon were to take over the world and they run a monopoly, well now you're the one that's getting the benefit because you own the company so your stock price would go up. But if Amazon ran the company into the ground, the CEO starts doing some shady things and then they go bankrupt, now your investment goes down to zero. So higher risk, higher potential reward. Versus in the passive method, when you invest in a fund that gives you exposure to Amazon, if Amazon took over the world, that'd be great, but it'd be balanced out by some of the losers. If Amazon went bankrupt, that wouldn't be good, but it'd be balanced out by some of the winners in the fund. So you have less risk, less upside, but also less downside. Here, you have more risk, higher upside, but also higher potential downside. And so now you have to understand that it's gonna one, take more time and more research because you're gonna to have to know and learn how to research and value a company and keep up with the company and the earnings calls. Likewise, when it comes to real estate investing, now instead of just passively investing your money into a fund, you're gonna look for a property, whether it's a single family home, whether it's an apartment complex, whether it's an office building, you're looking for some sort of property that you can buy for the purposes of generating cash flow. Now what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be analyzing locations, analyzing neighborhoods, analyzing properties, that way you could find a good deal. Now why do you wanna find a good deal? Because you wanna generate cash flow. When I invest in real estate, the number one thing that I'm looking for is not, how much can I sell this property for in two years? It's not, can I flip this property in six months? It's how much cash flow will I get? How much money do I have to put into this property today? And how much cash flow is this property gonna pay me month after month after month? So when I invest in a property, I'm looking for a 7% cash on cash return. That means for every dollar that I invest, I want seven cents in cash flow after paying for all of my expenses. So if I'm buying a property, I'm putting in $100,000 myself, I wanna see $7,000 of cash flow, $7,000 of profit year after year, to justify me investing the $100,000. Now, if property prices go up, that's icing on the cake. If property prices go down, well, 
oh well, I'm buying for the cash flow, I'm not buying for the property prices. So I don't really care where property prices go for me as an investor in real estate. I am looking for cash flow. That's what I like investing my money for. And we're going to talk more about this in number three. And that's how I do my analysis when I look for these types of real estate deals. When you actively invest in a business, you have a lot of different options here. You can invest in your own business. You can invest in buying somebody else's business. You can invest in a franchise or you can invest in startups. For me, mainly it is me investing in my own companies and me investing in startups. When you invest in your own company, of course it's risky because when I invest money into my own companies, there's a chance that the money that I put in will go down to zero. Then my company will go nowhere, then my company will go bankrupt. Likewise, when I invest in startups, it's the same thing. Most of the startups that I invest in will go to zero. That's just the nature of startup investing. When you invest in a startup, most startups will fail. But the whole goal with investing in a startup is hopefully one of the companies that you invest in or a fraction of the companies that you invest in will make it big and that will justify all the other losses that you get. That's how startup investing works. Now, how do you invest in a startup? Well, now because of the internet, there are a lot of platforms that make it a whole lot easier for you to do that. That will allow you to start investing in startups with as little as usually like $100 what are these platforms? Well, one is WeFunder, one is Republic, one is Start Engine. These are three of the largest platforms on the internet that allow you to invest in these types of startups. And as a little bit of a disclaimer, I am an investor in the WeFunder Corporation. If you want to invest in your own business, well, you got to have a business idea and you got to be willing to invest in your education and then in your own business. That way you can grow the companies. Then if you want to invest in somebody else's company, there's a lot of platforms on the internet that will help you find a company to buy. This is where now you're looking for a business to operate. These might be a franchise businesses or they might not be franchise businesses where now you're looking to actually purchase the company. Some of these companies will require you to be involved in the company, work there or manage the company. Other companies, usually with higher dollar figures, a million dollars or more, will sometimes allow you to be more of a passive investor where you can buy the ownership in the company without having to work there, without having to actually operate the business because they'll have a management team in place. So if you want to own a business and operate it, but you don't want to start it yourself, well, then you can actually go out and buy a business. Now, of course, it's going to take more money, but that is an option for you if you want to be an active investor in business. And then you have a whole bunch of other types of investments. You can invest in cryptocurrency. It's much more speculative, more upside, more also potential downside. Before you go and invest in something like cryptocurrency, make sure you actually believe in it and understand what it is that you're investing in and all the other alternative asset classes. Now, for some people, trading cards have become an investment and art has become an investment for some people. But the only thing that I want to say about that is that with these types of alternative investments, they're really going to vary depending on how much money people have. Because if people are running out of money, the economy is slowing, they're not going to care about the value of their trading card. They rather own an investment that's producing value and they rather care about what food they're going to eat. So the value of these types of more alternative investments are really going to be justified based off of how much money is in the economy and how strong the economy is. When you were in an up economy and everybody's rich, sure, you'll see the value of these alternative investments rise. When you're in a down economy and people don't have money, well, people would rather buy an investment that's producing more value. So just something to keep in mind, especially if you're just getting started, make the bulk, the vast majority, if not all of your investments, something that has been proven the test of time and something that is producing value. That way you can get paid the way that you want to get paid which brings me to number three, how do you want to get paid? There are two general ways that you can get paid as an investor. Number one is appreciation, which is when the value of your investment goes up. And number two is cash flow. Appreciation means I'm going to go buy a stock for $100 and then it goes up in price to $200 a share, which means I made $100 per share. But you only get paid with appreciation when you sell your investment. If you don't sell it, well, that $200 could go back down to $100 or go back down to $50. So you don't actually make money or lose money until you actually sell. Cash flow is now when you're getting paid without selling. So if you buy a stock for $100 a share and the price goes up and down, but they're issuing a $3 dividend every year, that means it doesn't matter what's going on with the stock price, it's paying you $3 with cash every single year. For me, the bulk of my entire investment portfolio produces cash flow because I like investing for cash flow. My goal is to use this cash flow for my investments to live my life because cash flow, this cash flow that comes in is going to come in month after month, year after year, even when I'm not working. So my goal is to build up this cash flow. That way I can use this cash flow to fund my lifestyle because cash flow funds the guac flow. When you have enough cash flow from your investments to live your life, well, now you're financially free because you're going to keep getting paid because your investments will keep paying you even when you're not working. And now when you have this type of cash flow to live your life, you don't have to worry about your expenses. You don't have to worry about your income because the cash flow will keep coming, assuming you have good investments. 
but this is going to require more sacrifice on your end because the way that you get this cash flow is you make sacrifices today. You earn money and you don't spend money today and you take the money that you didn't spend and you put it into an asset that we just discussed that's going to pay you with cash flow. Now, what type of investments pay with cash flow? Well, stocks that pay dividends, they pay cash flow. Real estate pays with cash flow. If you own a business and it's generating profits, that profit is cash flow. The income that you're getting, your salary, your wages, that's not cash flow. That's your active income that you're working earning. The profits that you're getting for owning the business, that's the cash flow. So you have to understand if you're running a business, if you're actually working in it, you want to make yourself disposable because that way you can hire somebody else to take your spot. That way now the cash flow that you're getting from the profits, that's the cash flow. Your income that you're getting from working there, that's not the cash flow. So your cash flow can come from stocks, real estate, or businesses. The appreciation can come from really anything where now you buy an investment and you hope to sell it for a profit. Some of my investments are for appreciation, but the bulk of my investments are for cash flow because I value cash flow more than this. This provides me with stability. This provides me with a little bit less risk. This is more of the fun, more speculative types of investments. Now there are pros and cons with both because the pro with cash flow is you get paid now. But the con is if a company is paying out a dividend, that means it's probably not going to grow as fast because if a company has a million dollars worth of profit and they give it away in the form of cash flow, that's a million dollars that the company no longer has to invest in the company. It's a million dollars that the company no longer has in savings. So a company is now taking the cash out of its company and giving it to its owners, which means it's not going to be growing as fast versus a startup company, which when it makes a million dollars, it's going to take all million dollars and maybe more and invest that back into the company. That way it can grow bigger and faster. So when you're investing for this type of cash flow, you might not see the appreciation as fast. And secondly, when you get this type of cash flow, you also have to pay taxes. When you get this income, whether it's dividends or rental income or profit, you have to pay taxes on this income. Even if you reinvest this cash flow, like if a company is paying you a dividend and you automatically reinvest this dividend, you never touch it, it never even hits your bank account because it automatically goes back to buy you more stocks, well, you still have to pay taxes on the dividend income that you received. So you're taxed on the cash flow, the appreciation, you're not taxed on. You're only taxed when you sell. So if you really want to start investing, you don't need a million dollars. You don't need to have a Wall Street education. You don't need to have a ton of time. What you need is the right financial education and you need to know where to start. Hopefully this video will help guide you there. If you want some more resources, check out my free ebook that I have for you down in the description. That way now you can start investing and actually building your wealth. Let's talk about investing for cash flow because unfortunately there's a lot of, let's call it poo poo information out there on the internet when it comes to the topic of cash flow investing because a a lot of people say, oh, if you want to get rich, just get this passive income, create this drop shipping site, start this Amazon store, create this ebook, and you're going to be making passive income, this cash flow. But the reality is number one, that's not passive. And number two, it is so difficult to generate this type of cash flow. The way that real cash flow investing works for investors and helping people become extremely wealthy with cash flow is like this. I'm going to draw you right here for my male followers. I'm going to draw you a mustache. And for our female followers, I'm going to draw you a braid in my native language Punjabi we call a mustache a much and a braid a gut so now you go to work every single day at this job maybe this job is your business and then this job is going to pay you a salary now you're going to take a piece of the income that you did not spend at Gucci and Chipotle and you're going to take this money and you're going to invest it into this asset. Now this asset could be something like a dividend paying stock. It could be something like real estate. I'll talk about how you can do this in just a minute. But now you're going to take this money, put it into this asset that's going to be generally passive on your end. Not completely passive, but generally passive. And now that you own this asset, it is going to pay you with cash flow. Maybe you get a check every month. Maybe you get a check every three months. Maybe you get a check once a year. Just depends what this asset is. And now you can take this money that you're generating and you can either buy more of these assets that are going to pay you with more cash flow, or you can take this money and use it to go out and buy you a brand new car. That's going to be your choice, but this is how real cash flow investing works. Now, the thing that you need to understand about cash flow investing that nobody wants to talk about on the internet is that you don't get rich by investing for cash flow. You got to be rich first to get a lot of the cash flow that will make you wealthy. The reason why is because you got to take the money that you're earning that you don't spend at Chipotle and Gucci, and then you take this money to buy these assets. So you need the money to generate the cash flow in the first place. And this is why it's so difficult is because people hear this idea of generating passive income and cash flow, and it sounds very exciting. 
but the reality is when you generate this cash flow, you're generating a return on the money that you invest. So let's assume, I'm gonna be very generous here. Let's assume that you can get a 10% cash flow return. That's very high, by the way. But let's assume you can get a 10% cash flow return. That means if you invested $1,000 into this asset, you're gonna generate $100 after one year of cash flow. $100 from $1,000 is not gonna really pay you much. I mean, it's not gonna fund really anything in your life. Even if you invested $100,000, then you're only generating $10,000 a year. Now, $10,000 a year is a lot, but it's not even $1,000 a month. It's not life-changing money for you to go out and start driving a Rolls Royce. You need the money to invest to generate the cash flow. This is where people say, but Jaspreet, if I need millions of dollars to generate a lot of cash flow, what's the point of me even doing that? Well, the point isn't for you to go and invest into this cash flow asset today and never do it again. The point is you go to work every single day. You get this paycheck every week, every two weeks, every month. Every time you get paid, you're gonna take a little bit of this money and buy this asset. Now, when you do this week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year, decade after decade, now you're gonna be building a solid stream of cash flow, especially if you're taking this cash flow that you're generating and using it to buy more assets because now you're making money to buy cash flow and the money that your money makes is buying you more cash flow as well. And now if you do this for long enough, now you're gonna be able to build a solid stream. Now, the more money you invest into this asset, the more cash flow you're gonna be able to generate. And this is why I call it the decade of sacrifice. Because if you put in a decade of time where you're working to live smaller so you have more money here, and then you take this money and you use it to buy these assets that are paying you with cash flow, well now after a decade of sacrifice, you are gonna be able to reap the rewards of that, which is now you're gonna finally have a solid stream of cash flow. So if you wanna go through this decade of sacrifice, which is not easy, I mean, it's the reason why the majority of people will never become financially successful or wealthy. The majority of people do not want to make this financial sacrifice of you working to live smaller and earn more money, not so you can drive a BMW, not so you can buy all the fancy Gucci, not so you can have a big home, but so you can have more assets. And if you put in that work to own more assets that are paying you with cash flow, now you got the checks coming in every month, every quarter, every year, and now you have this money coming in without you physically working because remember, you gotta work here to get this check. You don't gotta work here to get this check. This asset cash flow is coming in passively. The only thing you gotta do here is make sure that your assets are still good. Making sure that you still own a good portfolio of stocks, making sure that your real estate is still good. All you gotta do here is monitor it. Here, you gotta go into the office or go into work and keep getting that paycheck because if you don't work, you don't get that paycheck. Here, if you don't work, you still get paid. But in order to get paid here, you gotta keep contributing money here week after week, month after month, year after year for at least a solid decade. And if you do that, now you're gonna have a brand new stream of income that can allow you to drive the nice car without worrying about the price. You have the money coming in here that will allow you to go on those vacations and not have to worry about the price. You got the money coming in here to buy the fancy clothes and you don't gotta worry about paying for it because it's your assets that are paying for it. It's not what you are working to pay for. This is how wealthy people really become wealthy because if you can build this type of cash flow, well now you have true financial freedom because now you have assets that are paying for your lifestyle instead of just you working to pay for your lifestyle. So what are these types of assets that you can invest in that way you can generate this type of cash flow? Now I'm gonna go over mainly two types of assets. I'm gonna talk about stocks and I'm gonna talk about real estate because these are probably the two most accessible ways for the average person to generate this type of cash flow. When you go out and you invest in a company in the stock market, what you're doing is you're literally buying a business. If you go out and you buy one share of the Amazon company, you become one of the owners of the Amazon company. If you go out and you buy one share of the Apple company, you become one of the owners of Apple. If you go out and you buy one share of Chipotle, you become one of the owners of Chipotle. If you go out and you buy one share of Sweetgreen, you become one of the owners of Sweetgreen. You get the idea. Now you're literally buying one of the pieces of ownership in that business instead of just buying a product that this business sells. Most people just think about businesses as their products. You go and buy things on Amazon. You buy the newest iPhone. You buy a Chipotle bowl. You buy a sweet green salad. That's how most people are wired to think. When you go out and you invest in a stock, now you're actually buying the business instead of the product. Well, some companies in the stock market, not all of them, 
but some companies on the stock market pay what's called a dividend. A dividend is a cash payment that you get as an investor for doing nothing except owning the stock. Now again, not every company pays out a dividend. And the reason why is because for a company to pay out this dividend, they have to have a big profit. So now when a company makes a profit at the end of the year, there's three things that they can do with this cash. Number one is they can save this money in case of an emergency. Number two is they can reinvest this money back into the company. Or number three is they can just give it away to you, one of the shareholders, one of the owners. Now, when it comes to saving the money in a company, you gotta think from the perspective of a business owner. If a company makes $100 million of profit and they kept $100 million in their bank account, well, there's dead cash sitting there. Not every company wants a ton of dead cash sitting there because the $100 million isn't generating a return for the company. Companies want to do something with their money or at least give this money to their owners. And so if a company has a big enough bank account or a big enough savings account, they might not wanna save more money which then brings us to option two, which is reinvest the money back into the company. Now, if it's a smaller startup growth company, you bet they're gonna wanna invest all of this money, maybe and some more through debt and other investment money back into the company because they wanna grow bigger. They wanna expand their market share. They want to be a larger company. And when a company is trying to grow, they're gonna be investing everything that they can to open new stores, open new manufacturing plants, open new research and development facilities. That way they can keep expanding and growing their market share. But when a company becomes even bigger, and now you're a much larger conglomerate, and you don't really see that opportunity to keep investing and growing as quickly, now you might not want to reinvest all this money back into the company, which leaves now this cash back in the bank account. And if you don't want to just save it, well then you can give this money away to the shareholders, people like you, who own a piece of the stock. Now this is called a dividend and companies that pay a dividend generally pay out this dividend quarterly, meaning every three months. So now, if you buy a stock that's paying a dividend, that means you're gonna get a cash payment every three months for doing nothing except owning the stock. Now, does this come with risk? Of course. If you invest in a company on its way to bankruptcy, well, eventually they might cut that dividend, or they'll have to cut that dividend. Plus, you can also see the value of that stock fall. And this is where you have to understand how to value an investment and know how to research a good stock. And you might be saying, but just breathe. I don't want to do all that. I don't want to keep up with the company. I don't want to research the stock. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to research the financials. That's okay. You don't have to. The alternative to investing into an individual company is to invest in something like a fund, maybe a dividend paying ETF, a dividend paying index fund, a dividend paying mutual fund. Now, instead of investing in one company, like let's just say Apple, now you can invest into a basket of companies that have say 500 different companies in here, and Apple is just one of the companies, and there's 499 other dividend paying companies in here. So now you can go out and find these dividend paying funds. Again, you have ETFs, mutual funds, index funds. You go out and find one of these dividend paying funds that invest in companies that are paying a dividend. Now you invest in one thing that's investing in 500 different companies. Now you can lower your risk because if Apple were to go bankrupt, well now you have 499 companies to balance it out. This way you can lower your risk, and keep getting those dividends that way now you can just keep throwing your money into one of these funds. So this is option one. You can invest into an individual company. I am not telling you what to invest in, just giving you an example. You can invest into an individual company that's paying a dividend, or you can invest into a fund that's paying a dividend. But again, the key is you gotta just keep reinvesting that money. Option number two is you invest in real estate. Now you're gonna go out and buy a property. Maybe it's a house, maybe it's an apartment complex, Maybe it's an office building, if that's something you're into. Maybe it's a retail building. Maybe it's a mixed use building. Maybe it's a storage building. You're going out and you're buying this property, but you're not buying it to live in or use yourself. You're buying it to rent out to somebody else. So now you buy this property, you rent it out to somebody else, maybe they live in or use this property. And then in exchange for them living in and using your property, they pay you rent. Now the key here is this rent has to be enough to cover your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees, any vacancy costs, and then if you have any debt, cover that as well, and then put some money in your pocket each and every month. That's the right way to invest in real estate. You have some people, especially when you're in a very hot seller's market like we've been seeing, when you're in a very hot seller's market, you will see investors go out who have a lot of cash, just go out and buy properties and say, you know what? I'm okay losing money every single month because I think this property is gonna be more valuable next year. So I'll be able to flip it for a profit. 
that's not the game that I play. That's too risky, that's too speculative because I have no idea where housing prices or real estate prices are going to be in a year. I don't like to play that game. What I like to do is I want to make sure I can make a profit in my cash flow every single month and just keep working to accumulate the cash flow. I just want to keep stacking the cash flow because now I know, okay, this property is going to make me $250 a month. If this property is going to make me $250 a month, I got to buy a second one for another $250 a month. After 10, I got $2,500 a month coming in in profit. After 100, I got $25,000 coming in in profit. And now it's a game of just stacking cash flow and how fast can I stack that cash flow. Now again, you don't have to be a real estate investor. You don't have to invest in stocks but you have to start putting your money to work if you want to start generating the cash flow. There's some people on the internet that say that the only way to build wealth is to invest in real estate. Well, there's a lot of people that have become extremely wealthy without ever touching real estate. You have some people that say, you have to go out and invest in the stock market if you want to be wealthy. Well, there are some investors that only invest in real estate that have never touched the stock market that have become extremely wealthy. What you need to do is find the right balance for you. Personally, I invest in stocks and I invest in real estate. It's just something that I'm interested in. You don't have to go out and blindly follow anybody else. You don't want to be a sheep. The idea is for you to go out and build your financial education, learn how to invest, and find the right strategy that works for you, that works for your family, and that works for your financial goals. Because at the end of the day, if you want to invest your money, you just want to make sure you get the best returns. For me, I like cash flow because cash flow is something that I can predict. And when I got the cash flow coming in, well, now I know I can go out and spend my money, at least the cash flow that I'm generating, and I don't really have to worry about it because even next month, I'm going to get another cash flow check. That's the way that I like to run my finances. So if you want to invest your money, you got to figure out the right strategy for you. And well, this goes over a couple of ways that you can invest your money for cash flow here. But what I want you to remember is that this is not where your retirement planning should end. Even if you have a 401k and an IRA, I still want you now to invest in addition to that into the taxable retirement accounts because now this is where you're going to be able to build true and real wealth.